Hey there, welcome to another episode of Life Design Plus, where we are mastering the art of living your authentic life. I'm excited for today's episode. I just got done recording it with my good friend, Josh Passler, AKA Finn Art, the Finn Artist. If you're a financial advisor, you've probably seen his work floating around, but if you're not, don't worry. You don't have to be a financial advisor to appreciate this story because we're going to talk about how he went from being a financial advisor to being a go-to designer for the financial advisor profession. So he's no longer a financial advisor. He is doing what is his passion. He's followed his heart. He's followed his intuition. And the story of how he got from an advisor to a designer is a great one. You'll find inspiration in it. You'll also learn some great lessons and he shares some really good perspective and a few resources that might help you on your journey. So you may not be leaving the financial advisor profession to do something else. You might not even be leaving any profession. You might be finding a way to work your passion into your life. I think this conversation is going to help you out greatly. As always, before I get to the episode, I want to ask you to take a moment and right now, maybe go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, but then also throughout the episode, Make mental notes, take notes, or even pause and leave a comment down below to let Josh know how his story inspired you. My guests come on. They don't get anything out of it. I'm not paying them. We're not that big yet. And I don't know if I'll ever pay a guest. So they're coming in to share their story in hopes of giving back and helping inspiring you or someone else. So let them know the words that they spoke, their story, what resonated with you and how it might be moving you forward. Um, It would be really, really appreciated by me, and I'm sure it'll be appreciated by them as well. All right, with that, let's get to this great conversation with my good friend, Josh Passler. I've had the luxury of sitting back in the background watching this transformation from Josh the advisor to Josh, the designer. And I have absolutely no doubts that you are, you are a designer at heart and that is where you're supposed to be because your talent and your skill at is ridiculous. But what I would love to kind of paint in this episode is the journey from advisor to designer. How did you understand it? How did you get there? The messy middle, all that stuff. So um, I already did your intro. They know who you are. They know where your website is and we'll, we'll remind them that at the end, but like real quick, kind of Give us the story of how you came to be a financial advisor and like when in that advisor experience did you begin to think about this world of design? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, you know, it. Uh, I remember I was uh, I was in banking and I was just a personal banker and this is like over a decade ago and you know I just wanted to uh, under I just wanted to understand finance a little bit more just because of my background. And I, like I was, I was taught to fear money, in a way for the next paycheck and whatnot. And uh, you know th- those uh, that mindset definitely halted me to pursue a lot of things. And it was it, it was my wife who actually helped me rewire my mind into seeing like abundance to to see that things are within reach to you know to uh, to pers- you know pursue the things that. I thought it was unreachable. And so I thought, why, why can't I be a finance professional? And I didn't know too much about it, but I knew I could get my foot in the door at TD Ameritrade here in Omaha. And that's where it all started. And so I just kind of worked my way up. Uh, and then I realized really quickly that I enjoyed helping people uh, just understand uh, the foundations of finance. Uh, it wasn't so much about managing, but I really enjoyed doing the little things to to brighten their day, their month, their year. Right. Um, soon enough, I beat. You know, I got my my licenses. Um, I actually got them right away, but I got my sixty five or sixty six. I know I had the seven sixty three, whichever one comes sixty five, sixty six. Um, and you know, I I realized how impactful this is, and not only in my life, but you know, my clients too. And it wasn't until where I started to uh, implement some design, some like artistic um, textures and patterns into like my business card, into a deliverable for a client. And I didn't think too much of it. I was like, let's just make this look good. You know, let's just make it easier to understand. Um, But soon enough, I wanted to get into the independent space. And I didn't really have a way in, nor did I know too much about it. I just knew about 
you know, TD Ameritrade, you know, the insurance agencies, um, TIAA. Um, and then I fell into a rabbit hole and I connected with a few independent advisors. And that's mm-hmm. when it all just kind of took off from there. I think it's really interesting. I mean, we might come back to like our money stories and, and how that kind of plays into things because that may mm-hmm. show up again as you transition from advisor to fin art and d- design work. But, mm-hmm. you know, so when you got into being the advisor and joined the work, when did you decide to like bring fin art to the forefront? And and was it the first, the first I knew of fin art was the portraits. But was that the first mm-hmm. thing you did under that under that brand under that name, or was there something before that led up to that? That's a great question. It it was not the first thing okay. uh, that I created in fin art. Um, I actually the fin, fin art started because I was listening to uh, uh, a podcast. It was the uh, the only fee only podcast, and Thomas Copeland was the guest on there. And Brock Buckles mentioned about if you hear an advisor talking about a product that is similar to a Roth IRA on steroids, then you probably want to get out of that meeting. Mm-hmm. And I remember exactly where I was. I was driving in my car, getting Starbucks because I'm a star- Starbucks fish like that. You know, I love my drinks. And um, I thought it was the funniest thing that I heard. And I was like, I, I, you know, it'd be a great idea if I can just like sketch that into like a little cartoon scene and post it on Twitter, tag the people, show my value, show like, Hey, I can I can design stuff. I know there's a lot of marketing assistants, but hey, I can be a planner and a marketing assistant and just like create all these visuals for them. And that's when it all started to click. And I thought, mm-hmm. all right, I'll just go ahead and make that. So I made a few of those. I started listening to more podcasts and I would just take little notes and little, you know, little sentences I thought that was interesting and and pretty much um, you know, create that into a little, little cartoon illustration. And then one day. I decided to uh, take an actual image of someone and draw them. And I tried many different styles and you were actually one of the first ones. And I thought, what if I just draw the shadows? And I remember being inspired by Tony's um, Instagram. Tony had a video where, or a photo where he was in front of one of his paintings and his painting on the wall was Michael Jordan's, uh, famous dunk, mm-hmm. you know, the, the air Jordan dunk, uh, during, you know, during the dunking contest and you couldn't see the full painting of Jordan cause he didn't paint it. He only painted like the shadows, you know, in the mm-hmm. highlights and it clicked right there. And I was like, Oh, that'd be so cool to make that into like a portrait. And so that's how it all started taking off. And it, it took off, uh, in a way I never expected. And it really put thin art in the scene. And that Tony is Tony Brown, a former uh, podcast guest on Life Design Plus. So shout out to Tony Brown, aka Tony Concept, who is working on a piece I'm so excited about. So I, I've showed on social media before. I have a Kendrick Lamar and a J. Cole painting that he did both of those. The Pursuit mm-hmm. Boy uh, with Bald Eagle logo, Tony did for me as well. But he's working on a custom piece that is inspired by The Alchemist. And that's going to go Ooh. in the podcast studio that I'll be recording in person and, and moving the video on there as well. So I can't wait to see that he's been, I know it's on there, but on Instagram, he's been showing pictures lately of him working and I know it's my mm-hmm. painting. So I'm really excited about that. But going back to the, the fin art, I remember those pieces, the, the sentences, mm-hmm. because it was very similar, but totally different style of like Jack Butcher. You know, mm-hmm. Jack Butcher is probably one of my favorite creators. And I honestly think he might be like a modern day Leonardo da Vinci. Like he is just really, yeah. He's brilliant. And like I saw something um, yesterday, it was a tweet that he shared that they're talking about the NFT markets and how they've gone down, but yet there's been some that have still done well. And his checks and his open one that he did are still doing awesome. But his NFT sales have done over 350 million in sales. And, but, but the way he got started is not so different than you. Like he was, he was working in agencies doing the other things that he was interested in. And he started, I mean, the first thing I ever bought of his was a daily calendar that you printed out. The daily manifest had nothing with visualization. And then he started doing the black and white photos. And that's where I think what you did was similar, but in your own way, he was taking quotes Mm -hmm. and creating a very simple image to represent that. 
and you were taking these concepts within finance, the world that you knew, but you had a lens that very few financial advisors had of creating this image from it. And advisors love to find creative ways to like display these messages. So like, I remember those, the timeline in my head mm -hmm. was just off. I thought those came after the the portraits. First off, Jack Butcher is amazing. I, I, I got a lot of inspiration from him, from taking his courses to uh, buying some of his stuff. It's it. I, you're right. He is like Da Vinci in the modern Da Vinci. Uh, even like every word he says is almost calculated, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I wish I could do something like that, but I just ramble. I just think out loud at times. Um, but yeah, the the what came next after the portraits were the illustrations of mm -hmm. financial concepts because I knew I remember reading a tweet from someone and I didn't like it at the time, but they were speaking the truth and they said that this is a seasonal portrait. This is a seasonal item. And I thought, no, this is evergreen. And then I thought, ah, shit, you know what? They are right. They are right. You know, and I know you and I discussed about just uh, bringing portraits out every once in a while, kind of like a special pair of Jordans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a Saturday. But instead, we we needed to evolve. We needed to get to that new um, that new pivot and continue to evolve the art. And honestly, I didn't know what direction that was going to turn out to be until someone uh, until Eric messaged me and asked me if I can make a logo for him, then mm -hmm. it just, it just like opened up the gates, uh, to a whole new world. But before we get to like what you're doing now and the design work now and the logos and the brand work and all of that, mm -hmm. was there a moment that you knew I'm, I'm not a financial advisor anymore. Like that is not where my passion lies. My talents, my gifts, my interests all pulled me towards the design, even though I don't know how I'm going to make this thing a career, but I'm not a, like, was there a, a moment or an aha moment? No, there wasn't an aha moment. It was many aha moments. It was many, many thoughts. Um, and I would think about, I would, I would ask myself almost every day if I wanted to still be an advisor or do I really want to put 100% into pin art and I, you know, the funny thing is I was asking myself that, but I wasn't doing any advisor work. I was doing mm -hmm. only fin art. I was, I was busy with the portrait. I was busy with the illustrations. And still I would ask myself almost every day if I wanted to, you know, have, uh, you know, a financial planning client. Cause I, I could, I, I had the option to, but having that, you know, having a, a passion become a, a job something that could pay me every month was, was huge. And it wasn't until about month six where I didn't look back. I, mm -hmm. I stopped thinking about being an advisor and I just said, Hey, all my designations, licenses, they're going to run now. They're going to expire. And that's perfectly fine. I don't see myself going back. I see a new future. I see abundance. I feel it. I sense it. And I'm just going to run with it. I'm going to keep designing. It's going to keep evolving. And I, you know, I can't see the future, but I can at least feel it. I know the trajectory that I'm on and it's no longer, you know, being, being uh, a financial advisor. You mentioned something I want to go in on um, because there was a, a tweet in a LinkedIn post today that I actually responded to that I don't usually re like mm -hmm. respond in the comments, but it was uh, from Nick Majuli, who I like, I'm friends with Nick and it wasn't like, it, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a bad message that he put out, but basically he said he had a hot take that follow your passion mm -hmm. is horrible career advice. And I don't, and my comment was, I don't necessarily disagree, but I don't think mm -hmm. that that is a universal truth for everybody. And I don't mm -hmm. like, it bothers me and frustrates me when people live in absolutes that you can't, you can't follow your passion. That's, that's, that's dumb advice for some people. It is for you following your passions mm -hmm. was the right choice. And you know, what I tried mm -hmm. to convey in my comment, which I want to convey on this podcast, because there are going to be people listening to your story that they should follow their passions. And maybe they should do it in the way that you did kind of on the side. And then there's a, there's a tipping mm -hmm. point where they can make a pivot, but there are other people that they shouldn't follow their passions because when the passion becomes the job, it's no longer a passion. That's not been your experience. So I want people to see that your passion as a job doesn't necessarily take it away from being a passion. And in fact, it might even make it a stronger passion. Yeah, and I, that's very true. 
And and then the fine, so and then Nick also was saying that like his recommendation was, and this is what Cal Newport wrote in one of his books, which I think is a possibility that find something you're good at and that your passion will develop. But like how many people in the world are good at their job but hate it and the passion never comes and now they're making a good living, they don't enjoy their life. So what I my mm -hmm. said, my thought was I think the compromise is passion should find its way into your life in one form or another. But it's mm -hmm. up to the individual to find the authentic way that passion is in their life. For some, it could be their career. For some, it could be a side hustle. But like, you have to have passion in your life. Otherwise, there's nothing that lights you up that makes you enjoy. So I, I, I wanted to bring that, and I don't like to do like soliloquies in my podcast because it's about you. But you mentioned right. it was a passion of yours, and you could make your passion your job. And for mm -hmm. you, that was the right answer. Yeah, I well, first off, I need to read what Nick wrote um, because I know he does uh, fantastic writing, and I'm I'm sure he has a really good opinion, and I'm sure there's more to it than what we discussed. But what what was the old saying? Opinions are like asses; everyone has one. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing: he's not wrong. He's not wrong. You know, there, there there's that starving artist, you mm -hmm. know, uh, profession, and it's true. And you know, if I were just to go out there and I was like, hey, I design stuff, check out my work, you know, it's probably not going to go anywhere. I actually have to market my work. Like mm -hmm. I know really good designers that they don't they don't have a lot of work or they don't have a you know a really good price point because they can't market themselves. So I think there is a lot around what he said. And I will say this, it is um, you know, I years ago when I was an advisor, um, and this is when COVID started. I went, I did like a human design one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a coach. And based on my human design, she mentioned that in the mornings before work, I need to do something that I love to do in order mm -hmm. for me to have enough energy to get through the day through work. Because work is not, wasn't my passion. It was a way to make money. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoy talking to, to the clients and helping people, but you know, at the end of the day or beginning of the day, I wanted to do something that I, I truly love. So I started doing that and people can do the same thing. You know, they, they, they can do it as a side hustle. They can do it for fun. They can, they don't have to tell anyone, you know, if it's going to, if they're improving their skill set, and eventually they have some clients on the side and it starts building up. Great. That's wonderful. That's, that's a good way to do it. But the biggest thing is having people on your side. If mm -hmm. you don't have people on your side, then you're going to fail because there's only so much you can do. And if it wasn't for my wife on my side and, and I mean, realistically guiding me and helping me and uh, help me um, change my mindset around a lot of things, I definitely wouldn't be in this position right now. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be a designer. I would still be an advisor. And I don't know what kind of an advisor. I mm -hmm. probably would be an advisor still in a private office at Prudential uh, selling LERPs, you know, and screwing people over. I don't know. There's mm -hmm. just a lot of different things uh, that could have could have went my direction. But I am here in this position. I am here uh, with, a you know, a full-time job with my passion as my job, creating, designing every single day that I get to. It. So it, it, it is a blessing. But yeah, there is a, yeah. Chasing your passion, it doesn't have to be a career, but mm -hmm. I mean, make it what you want it to be. All right, sorry to interrupt, but I promise I will be really quick. You might notice the new hat, the one of one pursuit hat, the keep pursuing new colorway. And if you are ever going to be interested in potentially having your own hoodie or your own hat, the only way you will ever be able to cop one is if you are a subscriber to the Daily Notes. And the only way you can subscribe to the Daily Notes is if you go to justincastelli.io. I decided not to do a pop-up, but if you go down to the bottom of the page, you can subscribe there. Because when I do a drop, whenever it might be, the only place that I'm going to announce it and allow people to purchase it is through the email subscription. So if you want your own one-of-one -one hat or whatever I might create in the future, or your Keep Pursuing hoodie or your one-of-one -one hoodie or whatever else comes on the clothing as well, the Daily Note subscription is where you need to be to get it. I want to create a lifestyle brand over time that is for the individual pursuing their authentic life and having meanings that is meaningful to them and only doing it for those who are on the inside and on the know. So if you want one of these in the future, 
then make sure you're subscribed to the daily note and while you wait for the drop to come you'll get the daily note into your inbox every day and if you don't want the daily note you can subscribe and let me know to the weekly note which will have all of the daily notes in it but it will come every saturday with some additional content if you happen to get the subscription on linkedin you will not get the information on the drop so if you're only getting the daily note through linkedin you might want to hop over to the email um, as well you can get the weekly note there also that does not show up on linkedin so again if you want one of this uh, one of these hats one of these hoodies in the future or whatever else might come email is the only way you're going to find out about it the drops will go down there i don't have any planned but who knows when i might do one justincastelli.io down at the bottom subscribe in the box there and i'll let you know when the first drop's coming all right with that let's get back to the episode with josh i'm glad you brought up your wife because i was going to ask about the support because you know leaving a career that you know i'm assuming there was you had income coming in as an advisor you had clients mm -hmm. so leaving a career to follow something that you really enjoy more, that makes you happier, makes you a better husband when you're creating. Um, and mm -hmm. the financial implications of that, like you have to have a supportive partner. Um, so I'm glad you you brought her up. I also mm -hmm. am glad you brought her up again and mentioned the mindset change and the shift that you had and how she was instrumental in that. Can you okay. share, like, how were you able to change your mindset? Because our mind can be our greatest ally or our worst enemy. And on paper, it seems like it should be easy just to change your thoughts and the way you look at the world, but it's not always that easy. So how were you able to shift from more of a, a scarcity mindset to an, a mindset of abundance? Like what, what was the path that you took to do that? Um, time. It took time. It took time, patience, and her not uh, pushing it on me. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, she, she was doing it herself. Mm -hmm. um, I thought she already had a really good mindset, but she was meditating she was reading, she was watching videos, taking courses, and I saw the influence that it had on her. And I'm the kind of person that just kind of watches from afar and just kind of takes it in, studies it visually and and say, hmm, that, that looks like it's working. That that makes a lot of sense. And I thought a lot of it was wushu bullshit for the most part, like manifestation and law, law of attraction. I thought it was crap for the, you know, at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. But then the more I saw it, the more it was in my life every single day. And we were working from home. So I saw it all the time. The more my I started to say to myself, well, maybe that's not crap. Maybe that makes a lot of sense. And then I started to interpret it in a way to where it made sense. And I've actually had done what she's doing in my life at some point or another. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, if I really wanted some, if I really wanted to buy something, I had to make something happen. I had to put the energy, the time, the effort into something. And that's realistically law of attraction. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it, but I started putting those little pieces together. And I thought this, and I and I thought to myself, why am I so close-minded around these things? That's just gonna prevent me from doing great things later on. And so I I decided, right, like at that point to just have more of an open mind, take it in. And then try to interpret it in ways that I understand that I can, you know, think back on my past and, and kind of put two to two together. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that helped quite a bit. And that that's what uh, led me to, you know, kind of rewire my mind and see things a lot differently. I love that. Um, Cause one, mm -hmm. I, I, I share the same beliefs that your wife has and that you now understand, but I love mm -hmm. that from the standpoint of there are going to be people watching and listening that think woo woo is bullshit like like you did so yeah. to hear somebody yeah. who once believed that way see it and then experience it may make mm -hmm. one of those doubters be more open minded and i think the key for me has been like once you experience these forces if you will then it becomes a little bit easier to believe and then the more you believe the more you experience it. and then eventually you're like yeah, 100% my thoughts are bringing to me what I want or what I don't want. Like there's truth to it, but uh -huh. you have like, we can't tell the people that this is true. We can only share our uh -huh. story and and hopefully open their mind to allow them to experience it. And then once you experience right. it, it changes the game. Was there a, yeah. a book or anything that really stands out that if somebody is kind of like, all right, well, maybe I should give this a second look and give some attention. Like, is there a book or something that was meaningful to you that might be meaningful to, to someone else? Kind of, but not really. Um, 
Well, give us the kind of, but not really, <laughs> so, because it, it came to your mind for a reason. So it yeah. might be meaningful to somebody out there. So the one that made a lot of sense, and she she has a few books out. Her name is Amanda Francis. Okay. And I mean, she, I mean, she's kind of like a financial guru, kind of not, but she's more about the mindset and the possibility of, uh, you know, if like if you you can simply just ask for money, you can uh you, you can you can attract money. If you put like a hundred you know, like a few hundred dollar bills around your house and you see that every single day, you you are attracting that energy. You are attracting hundred dollar bills. You can say like you know thank you to the universe to give you, uh th- thank you for this thank you for this money. Uh, and I'm open to more, you know, you have to have that openness. You have to speak to the universe, your angels, your spirits in order for it to make it happen. And and she did a, a, such a great job at explaining that. And she's so down to earth and not like a Jay Shetty type. She's more, you know, like me, her language is, is mine. She's, she's cussing. She's, you know, um, kind of like a, oh my God, Jen Sierra. She's like, a, I'll make you, or you are a badass book mm-hmm. that, that, uh, those novels or those books. Um, she's, she has that same sort of tone, which is like a down to earth, no bullshit type of person. And she's making this happen. And I resonated with her and Jen so much that it started to make a lot more sense. So those books, um, really helped out. But mm-hmm. one book that I, that just came to mind, I think it's called the having, okay. it's, uh, it is, and this one was like, I don't know it, it, apparently it's real, but it's, I believe she was a Chinese journalist. And she she talks about her journey with a uh, a financial guru, like this very very young girl who could predict markets and all this stuff and and everything. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of like the world leaders would come to her to get her opinion, to get her analysis of things. And so she would follow this girl around and like you know just pretty much interview her. And one of the things the lady taught her was was like listening to your to your gut like the very Mm -hmm. first like instinctive like thought the feeling the emotions you get not not like not the not the not the thought that you've had time to make it rational or irrational but the very first instinctive like split second like you didn't even notice it was there moment Mm -hmm. and she says that is the one you go with at all times and so i spent time like just kind of feeling that and you feel it a lot when you go to make a purchase of something. Like you have like this green light, red light moment in your head immediately when you're about to buy something. Like if it's a big purchase and you're shaking a little bit and you're kind of afraid, you have like this red light going up that's saying like, stop, you shouldn't be doing this. Other times you have like green moments. And she says, whenever you go to make a, you know, swipe or debit card or, you know, tap or debit card, um, you're supposed to say to yourself, like, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for allowing me to make this purchase. Mm-hmm. And it is like putting that energy out there and that attraction out there that you are like being very open to the universe, to the money. And you unexpectedly come to find more, you know, mm-hmm. and those are, those are, those are what I kind of read and figured out through these books. And like I said before, my wife, she showed me all these books. She practices and preaches all these stuff. I've never found, I've never seen anyone find more money than she has. Mm-hmm. Everywhere we go on vacation or somewhere, she's finding money from a penny to a few times to a hundred dollars at the jolt in uh, mm-hmm. in Vegas last year. She's finding cash everywhere, money everywhere. And, and why is that? It's not because she's lucky, but because she's opening up to accepting all this money. And it just so happens to be there when she's there and mm-hmm. you know, it's not a coincidence. If you're, if you're saying this is a coincidence, and I, I'm sorry to tell you, but it, you're, you're bullshit. It is all fate. And it happens to be fate. There's no coincidence. It's all fate. And everything happens at the exact time for exact reason. So sorry. Thank you for coming to my Ted talk. No, no, I, I love it. First <laughs> off, I'll link to uh, Amanda and also link to the book. I looked, I pulled them up while you're talking to see it. Um, nice. So I'll put this so people can check those out um, because you know, different things resonate for different people, but I'm glad mm-hmm. you brought like, that's the super woo of like really opening yourself up law of attraction and being there. And like, it's tough, mm-hmm. especially as a former financial advisor and a, you know, a life planner myself to, to say that to people, especially when they're feeling financial stress, 
And I don't know. I mean, if you go to the super belief of it, like you could will, you could, you could believe yourself out of the financial stress. Um, but I do think there is a lot to the energy and attracting. And there have been countless times where there might be a little bit of a financial discomfort in my life. And because I maintain optimism, shortly behind that mm -hmm. discomfort is the solution that takes care of it. And I think that like, you know, in the book, The Secret that came out years ago, you know, they talked mm -hmm. about the law of attraction, but they did it in a way that I think dismisses the magic behind it. They made it basically seem like if you want to win the lottery, you just got to want to bad enough. And what I think is that right. my belief and my experience has been as you kind of go through this process of trying to bring to you what you want by your thoughts and your energy and your, your, your vision, like your vision is that sometimes things come to you in a, in a way different than what you expect. And I use that lottery ticket as a, as an example of saying, okay, if somebody wants to win the lottery, let's peel back the layers of the onion. Why? Well, they you know, have some mm -hmm. financial stress when they want to save more, some, some type of financial stress. Okay. So what you really want is a, is to relieve that financial stress. Great. And if they are believing the secret and they're, man, they're, they're trying to manifest winning the Powerball and winning a half a billion dollars, they might miss the fact mm -hmm. that they get a bonus or that they get a small inheritance right. or they find a hundred. Like they might mm -hmm. miss that. Oh, you know what? Like this little smaller amount, this non half a billion that came to me actually alleviates my stress, but they miss that because they're focused mm -hmm. on Powerball and they miss that the universe answered their true problem, the root of the problem in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be open right. to that. So I, like I do little things like that. Um, I have a, earlier this year, I bought a money clip because I never carry cash around. Mm -hmm. And Bob Proctor mm -hmm. passed away last year. I think it was last year. And he was real mm -hmm. big on law of attraction. Like his whole career was built around this. And he said that he walked yeah. around with, I don't know, like a thousand dollars to show the universe that he was somebody who was open and welcome to money. So I don't carry around a thousand dollars, but I have a money clip that I carry around cash and a two dollar bill because that's supposed to be good luck. And then I had yeah. uh, triple eights transcribed on there because that is a number that oh. represents abundance. So I carry mm -hmm. that, and then I shared on another podcast. I in following the the Jim Carrey story of him carrying around a $10 million check in his pocket and his first big acting paycheck being $10 million. I wrote a million dollar check to myself for five years down the road to jumpstart the mm -hmm. pursuit collective brand to the next level. And I have it in my wallet and I carry it around with me. So just little things like that, that like it might seem crazy. It might seem silly. And you know what? Maybe they never manifest. But I think that mm -hmm. they will, they will, they show and they will bring the energy that will attract um, these things. And maybe it's not a million dollars in the future, like, but it will it represent, I will be in a position in five years to this collective uh, idea that I have with pursuit to be able to significantly invest in that, to take that thing to the next mm -hmm. level. Um, so I, I'm glad that you brought that woo to the, to the conversation and, and it wasn't me. Um <laughs> I don't know if you have any like closing thoughts on that because there's something I want to double back on with the transition from advisor to FinArt and then we'll get into FinArt today and in the future. But any closing thoughts on this really, really woo phase of our, our conversation? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I'm sure I, I, I don't, I mean, we can spend like 20, 30 minutes on this, <laughs> but we should probably continue. No, I think those books would, would explain it better than I can. Well, no. I, I think the books will help. And I also agree that we shouldn't spend mm -hmm. too much more time on it because we'll lose people. But I, I do think that your, ex like, your experience matters because you are mm -hmm. another person planting a seed in front of people mm -hmm. who changing their mindset will significantly change the outlook of their life and the trajectory of their life. It may not help them find millions of dollars, but it may take them from right. a place of scarcity to a place of abundance so that they can begin to take mm -hmm. more control of their life. So no, your, yeah. your stories and your sharing were extremely important. Um, going awesome. back to going from advisor to FinArt, I know you're mm -hmm. a confident person. I know that confidence grew as you shifted from scarcity to abundance, but how did you have the confidence to push through the beginning phases in the background that I saw of changing business models? You know, at one point you had the idea of having an inventory of Canva things that advisors could use. Like, like there were a lot of iterations that people didn't see that could have been frustrating to, mm -hmm. to some that could have pushed people to give back, give up and go back to being a financial advisor. How did you maintain mm -hmm. the confidence and the drive to not give up as you were figuring things out?
Oh man, that's that's a really good question. There were a lot of ups and downs, and there was a lot of uh, car rides with my wife where we we would go somewhere, and within like the first like minute of being on the road, I would just mute the radio, and I would just like talk out my frustrations, and she would know that that's just me venting and problem solving because I think out loud. And I, I eventually will get to a solution or she'll help me get there. Um, but I, I knew right away, like I needed uh, guidance. I needed a circle. I needed a coach. And, and that's why I came to you because I knew, you know, you're a creator, you're a creative, you, you, you know, you know what I'm going through. And I felt like I was splintering myself in so many different directions that I didn't know what was going to work. I didn't know what was going to sell. Uh, at, at one point I was like, do I have any marketable skills with this? And, you know, it, it, it was frustrating uh, for, for a while. Um, but the one thing I just kept doing was I kept creating. I kept, uh, you know, making art in public um, and posting it everywhere. And eventually, like, it just you know, kind of like a Jack Butcher, uh, you know, famous poster of, like, you know, this to this doesn't matter. Then all of a sudden, like, you just see, like, this huge arch and huge up, upward trend of success and you know i'm feeling that now which is great but it didn't just come in the last couple of months or three months four months it it came from like the past almost two years of working evolving and posting in public Mm -hmm. and so those times where i was struggling that i was very unsure um it all like it, it all compounded to to making or to, to becoming what I am today. And I wouldn't have, if, if I were alone, I didn't have a wife. I decided not to uh, post in public. I decided not to, um, you know, hire you as a coach. I decided not to share my work with like friends, family. I, I would have given up month one, month two mm-hmm. easily. Yeah. How important was that phase of trying different, business models and ideas, which is ultimately what led you to find exactly the way you're supposed to be operating. How, how important was the experimentation phase? Oh, huge, huge. Um, because I was able to take bits and pieces from there mm-hmm. and, you know, bring it to where I'm at today. And I mean, any experience is good experience to me. I was saying yes to things that I didn't even know how to do, but I knew I could find out how to create it. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying like different subscription services to, you know, to one-off situations. Like I found out very quickly what I like and what I disliked and what I could see in my future and what I could just leave behind. Mm-hmm. Um, but that experience was, was not wasted. Is not really looked down upon, uh, uh, you know, looked down on for, for me. Because I was able to learn so much about myself and what I really wanted to do. And so if I didn't go through that, then I wouldn't be able to be in the position that I am in now. Mm-hmm. Um, just because my path that I want to take is not the clearest path, but it is clear enough mm-hmm. for me to become very successful. Mm-hmm. And the more I learn and the more experience I get, I get to figure out and have even a better path, a clear path. And I think, you know, you have to go through those trials and tribulations to, to be on the right road, to be on the right path. Cause without it, you know, shit, I, I remember the first, this is a terrible analogy in a segue, but I remember the first time I went to casino, I hit, I, I decided to, to play the slots and I hit like a, $200 jackpot, whatever it was mm-hmm. on top of the world, beginner's luck and everything. Guess what happened afterwards? I thought every single time going to the casino, <laughs> I would hit the jackpot because I was just that lucky and it never happened again. Mm-hmm. And after two years, I was like, I'm done, you know, but that's the thing. That's, that's, that's reality. You know, you have to go through the trials and tribulations to really fan out what is truly going to resonate with you and your passion and your future. I remember our, you know, conversations and Slack messages as, you know, figuring out the different models. And Mm -hmm. I was never nervous for you because I knew that you were moving closer to like what it was you're supposed to do. I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know it was going to be designed, but 
But I, I, I mean, I look at your work today and the design mm -hmm. work that you do today and compare that to like the images you were creating and the graphics, like those were good, but your mm -hmm. design work and your brand work is like light years above what mm -hmm. those are, or light years ahead, not above, light years ahead of where those were. Like those were good, but these are, mm -hmm. these are great. Um, like and it. I, from an outside observer, I think the reason, I mean, two years is a pretty quick ramp up, to be honest. Like it's the overnight success that usually takes 10 years. It took you two years. I was listening to the Founders Podcast episode about Jay-Z and he talks mm -hmm. about how Jay-Z's first album came out when he was 24 or 26, but he started right. rapping when he was 12. So we see Reasonable Doubt drop and we think, oh, like Jay-Z dropped a, a classic album on his first try. He's so good. Like he's amazing and he is. But it was mm -hmm. 14 years of practicing his craft to drop this thing. Right. You, know, you did it and you know there was design stuff you did prior, but two years is mm -hmm. a, a huge ramp up. And I think the reason is it was your passion. So like you became relentless with the work that you mm -hmm. were doing and the learning and the taking on things you didn't know how to do, but you knew you could figure it out, which is what allowed mm -hmm. you to really ramp things up really quickly. So let's talk about like yeah. FinArt, what it is today. Like what is, so FinArt started, you know, visualizing these, these statements, then it was illustrations, then it was graphics. What is FinArt today and where do you see it going in the future? Yeah. Great question. Well, per firstly, the fact that there's not a biopic of Jay-Z yet, you know, just his early life is crazy. And maybe he has to sign off on that. He definitely has to sign off on that. But the fact that there's not one, it's, it's ridiculous. There, there needs to be one here pretty soon because I think it could be like one of the best movies ever made. Um, but where FinArt is today and where it's headed is a brand design studio. Mm -hmm. um, now, the focus on on the brand identity is really, um, and Tony uh, Concept taught me this. Um, and in his words, he said, the objective for a brand identity design is to solve business issues with creativity. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget that quote for the rest of my life. It resonated with me so much. And it makes a lot more sense because it's not just a fancy design. It's not just a fancy logo. It's not just amazing colors. It's the overall look. It's the overall feel. It's the overall emotion you get from a brand. And if I'm able to create that and help solve issues within the business, and then I feel like my heart is full and I can continue doing that for decades. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I want that to become, you know, my, my, um, my career. Mm -hmm. And then 2024 it's, it's going in that direction. Now, will I expand and, and hire on, on like a partner? Like, will I have a partner? Will I have uh, like W2, you know, designers under me? I mean, that's, that's something that I'm definitely considering thinking about, but for now it's, it's really just me and my contract worked out to Colton uh, to make the websites wink, wink. Uh, mm -hmm. So shout out to Colton there, but, but yes, it is focusing on the identity uh, just because I understand how important it is uh, to have the true identity, the true values, the true personality traits, the mission, the, the, the vision, you know, um, the archetypes to, to really make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I mean, hell look at what Twitter was now look at what X is now. Mm -hmm. Perfect example of being lost in the sauce. They don't have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's because they didn't take the time. That's because they didn't really find themselves. The brand appreciator that I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who can create the design and create the brand, but I do have an eye mm -hmm. for it. Like I know good branding mm -hmm. when I see it. I know good design when I see it. Like that part of me wants to dive into your design style and how you developed it. And mm -hmm. maybe there's a future kind of like segment or something we can do where we talk about design and like maybe get into your passion a little deeper and talk about how you think about it. But I, I want to mm -hmm. stay on like your story and your journey because I think that's more sure. valuable for today. But know that I really, really want to talk about how you come up with your designs because I will, I will tell everybody this. If you go out and there'll be links in the show notes to your Instagram and, and all the pages, if you look at his designs, there are things hidden in every brand logo that he's created that you may not notice on first glance. 
And I absolutely love the thought that is put behind the logos when you do them. And then the mm -hmm. thought that is put behind the actual design when you do it as well. And then you start bringing in the colors mm -hmm. and all the visualizations you do to help bring the brand to life. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. Um, so anyways, I, I did just want to highlight that there is a lot of great design work that the average person never even notices. And when you understand that it's like really, really cool to see what someone like yourself does. Um, yeah. So, you know, as, as I think about kind of bringing this conversation to an end and kind of tying a, a bow on it, um, what are some of the biggest lessons you learned that maybe we haven't hit on in the transition from financial advisor to the go-to designer for financial firms? Like what are some of the lessons you learned? Roll with the punches. Right. Um, you, you, you just have to, you know, there's going to be trials and tribulations. You just got to, you know, if, if you have a goal in sight and you have to have a goal in sight, uh, I, I, I was going to say you have to have a plan, but uh, I can't say I had the clearest plan. I just had an idea. And yeah, I, I wrote down some stuff, but you have to go through the ups and downs to get to where you want to be at uh, without experiencing that then you're just going to end up in, oh man, in limbo, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be so much uncertainty, unsatisfaction. You have to go through like the baby steps to get to where you want to be. You got to be Jay-Z for like 12, 14 years of his life before you put out like a, a first hit album. Mm -hmm. You have to go through that. And, you know, I've, I've been sketching, drawing all my life. Never did I think I would actually make it into a profession, um, I wanted to when I was little, but I just, I didn't have the mindset for it. I didn't think it was a career that I, that I could achieve and could have, uh, but here I am now. Um, and I, I would say the best way to excel at, um, at your passion to turn it into a career is by having people on your side. You have to have a, 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 a great, you know, circle of people that appreciate your work that are not just yes people that will tell you when your shit sucks, uh, when it doesn't look good. Um, uh, you know, shout out to my wife. She she won't say it sucks, but she'll text me, oh cool. You know, and that's when I realize I'm like, that this ain't it. And <laughs> she'll say, like, this isn't this isn't really like the thin art style. And I'm like, oh man. But you have to have people like that. You have to have the realist. You have to have like that that group of people that you know you can rely on that's gonna, you know you know, push you to become better. So to take those courses and invest in yourself. You have to invest in yourself so much in mm -hmm. order for you to, uh, to become an expert. Um, I invest in myself so much. If I'm not actually working on a client's project, I am, I, I'm doing something. I'm on YouTube learning something about Photoshop Illustrator and design Figma. I am trying to, you know, I'm reading a, a new design book that I got. I have four design books that came from Amazon this week that I need to read on, but I'm, I have now like almost like a library of design books that I've read that, I, that I've studied that I've got inspiration from. You have to do that. If, if this is a passion that you want to, that you want to turn into a career, you got to be the hungriest motherfucker out there. You have to, or else, you know, someone else is going to be doing it and they're going to be doing it better. They're going to be hungrier. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, you, you, you just got to go for it. You got to go for it. You got to dive. You got to take that leap of faith and, and just run with it. I mean, there's a lot of random words that I just put, but one of the funniest examples I can give up is uh, there's an old Kobe uh, commercial with Kanye West. Do you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about? When yeah, I know what Kanye's talking about. in the stand. <laughs> and he's like, what do I, what do I, what do I got to do to become better? He's like, sell more albums. He's like, but I already like sold, sold the most. Like, what else do I got to do to become great? And, and he's like, are you the, are you this uh, same animal, but a different type of beast? And he's like, what the fuck does that mean? Kobe Bryant. <laughs> and everyone's clapping. That's pretty much what I just said. But mm -hmm. um, you, you just gotta be an animal and you gotta like, you gotta be the hungriest motherfucker out there. And I think a lot of successful people say that. Um, and if, if you want to find the drive to excel at in your passion, I mean, go watch a David Goggins interview. That'll do enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I just want to point out one thing for the listener. You know, if because some some people know their passion, some people don't. They mm-hmm. just know that there's something missing. Like this this the reason I want to have different people on is because they're coming from different angles and different experiences. But there's something you said that like my eyebrows went up. You said mm-hmm. that when you were younger, you used to draw a lot. Well, you've always sketched, but when you were younger, you thought it wanted you wanted it to be your career. And here you are mm-hmm. years yeah. later doing the thing that your younger self knew was the right thing for you. My point of bringing that up is mm-hmm. I wonder if sometimes when we are younger, we do know what it is. Like before we go through schooling mm-hmm. and kind of get into the institution of life where we, we mm-hmm. are born with this understanding of knowing more so of who we are, our innocence allows us to dream big and then think and believe that we can do anything. And it and our younger self knows what we should be doing. And then we kind of get into, you know, stories being told to us and things that we, and, and life kind of shapes our view and changes it. So the point mm-hmm. of bringing that up is if you find yourself in a position where you feel like something's missing, something's lacking, you're not quite sure what it is you might have an interest in that you want to try, go back to when you were a kid and like, what were the things you enjoyed as a kid and, and give those a try and bring those back into your life and just see what mm-hmm. happens. Maybe it's nothing right? or maybe you turn into fin art and your own version of whatever that might be. So I'm glad you said that because yeah. um, I didn't expect it. So it was pretty cool. All right, man. Awesome. My, my final question for you is the one that eventually at some point I'll stop giving Steven Jackson um, and Matt Barnes the, uh, the credit for, it. but I do love their question on all the smoke podcast. And my final question for you is um, if you could see one guest on the show, who would you like it to be with the caveat being that you have to help get that person on? From a creator perspective? From anything, from somebody you would want to hear from that you think you could learn from or somebody you know has a story that would inspire others. It doesn't necessarily have to be a creator. Well, I'm just saying from my perspective, mm-hmm. uh, being a creator, explorer, I mean, i like to see what you can get out of Russ. You know, I don't listen to a lot of his music, but I've heard him talk and speak, and he has such a a fascinating, unique insight into the world that if we can have him talk about his inner thoughts and process on here, it might open up a whole new gateway for people. So but I'm sure I can make some cool art for that. I would, uh, I would, I would love that. Yeah, maybe some art will get his attention. Um, I've. Yeah. I've I'm I'm working on getting him. He's on. I've ri- written him on my list of people. I've sent him DMs mm-hmm. before, and I know one of these times it's going to get through. Um, so I will I I will accept that. And if there's anything you can do to throw out into the universe to bring his attention, um, I will happily accept it. I would love. It. He's in. Uh, he's going on tour, and um, mm-hmm. he's going to be in Chicago this summer. So I'm trying to mm-hmm. find somebody to go up to Chicago with me to go see him um, in concert. But. Uh, yeah, I would love that. That'd so great recommendation. Um, Appreciate it. All right, man. Well, hey, where can everybody find you? I'll have them all in the show notes. I know where to find you, but where can everybody go in case they're not in a position where they can look, but they can hear it? Yeah, if you, uh, I post all my work on on Twitter and LinkedIn. I mean, it's my online portfolio at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. On LinkedIn, if you just search up the fin, uh, or fin art, you'll find me. Uh, you'll find my profile. Uh, Twitter is the fin artist. Uh, or my website, which is the thin artist.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do post my work on there. It kind of explains what I do pretty well. Uh, website will be updated here shortly. Um, but yeah, you can always just reach out to me. I'm always game to talk uh, mm-hmm. to, to anyone about design art. And uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of advisors, they want to get better at their visuals. So let me ask away. Mm-hmm. Let's have a conversation. Well, I will have that in the show notes. And if you are driving, listening on the podcast, you know the website, justincastelli.io. Up top, there's Life Design Plus podcast. Click in there. You'll see the episode. Show notes will be there. It'll be in the bio of the YouTube video as well. Uh, but I do have a lot of advisors in the audience. So if you mm-hmm. are an advisor and you are looking to redo your, your design work, your branding, your website, um, I would definitely connect with Josh. Um, I vouch for him. Um, I'll co-sign. And I don't do that to to just anybody. So uh, his work is impeccable. He does a really good job. So if you're an advisor and that makes sense to you, um, hit Josh up. And for everybody who's not an advisor, follow him just to see what good design look, looks like and and to follow his journey. Like you're getting you're, you're getting to hear the behind the scenes as he's hitting that point of the Jack Butcher image, which is right behind my computer, 
of this is pointless and he is on the first of the big you know the hockey stick growth so um follow along mm -hmm. his story support him um and josh i appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and uh helping somebody out there uh, realize their story a little bit more and, and go on their path so i'll let you get going man and i appreciate your time and your story appreciate it thank you